Thank you, and uh, I'd like to reconvene uh, this meeting of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee and welcome people back to the meeting. Could I just, before we go any further, ask members if there are any declarations of interest that they wish to make before this session? Uh, Peter. Yes, convener, I want to declare that I am a, a member of a farming partnership in the northeast of Scotland. Uh, Stuart. Uh, I am a joint member of a small registered. I'm the joint owner of a small registered agricultural holding. Thank you. And I also would like to declare uh, that I am a member of a, a farming partnership. Could I welcome uh, the Right Honourable Michael Gove, Secretary of State for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs for the UK Government. He's giving evidence today to us by video conference on the implications for Scotland of the UK's departure from the EU. Um, we're going to go straight into questions, Mr. Gove, and the, and the first one is from Peter Chapman. Peter. Good morning, Mr. Gove. Um, can I just say that uh, I'm going to start off on the fisheries issue because uh, obviously it's a, an important thing in the northeast where I stay. And uh, the UK fisheries bill in particular. And on, on 24th of April, Mr. Ewing told this committee it would be premature to bring fisheries legislation before the Scottish Parliament when we do not know what additional powers the UK fisheries bill would confer on Scotland. So my question is, can you clarify the additional powers that the UK fisheries bill will confer on Scotland and how these could benefit the Scottish industry? Well, uh, thank you very much, Peter. And um, my apologies to the committee that I can't be with you in person as I would have wanted to be. Um, but I had the opportunity, obviously, of um, being in Scotland um, just under a fortnight ago in Aberdeen, where I met representatives of the uh, uh, fish processing sector and the catching sector as well. I'm looking forward to being back in Scotland at the end of this week. Um, the Fisheries Bill will provide an opportunity for uh, the Scottish Government to uh, um, more effectively manage uh, Scotland's fisheries resources. We're in uh, conversation with Fergus about exactly what powers he believes are necessary um, in order to make sure that uh, Scotland can benefit. But it's the case that the Scottish Government themselves have um, acknowledged in the work that they've done that uh, uh, leaving the uh, EU and taking back control of our waters and leaving the common fisheries policy will mean that there are um, thousands of additional jobs and hundreds of thousands of additional pounds which can be injected into uh, the UK economy. Um, and uh, uh, I'm open to any proposals that Fergus has in order to make sure that the bill can work for um, all parts of the United Kingdom, but in particular that uh, the coastal communities of the North East can benefit more. Yeah, well, we, we are, you know, the, the, the fishing industry in the North East looks forward to that happening. Um, I suppose the, 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 ba the basic question is, uh, do we still feel that we can't come out by the end of 2020, as was originally envisaged? Uh, I do hope so, yes. Um, and that's uh, absolutely the government's plan. It all depends on whether or not um, uh, our parliament in, uh, in Westminster uh, passes the European Bill, and the Prime Minister signalled last night that she'd be bringing it forward, um, God willing, um, in the first week after our Whitson uh, recess. And uh, I hope that uh, it's certainly the case, I think, that um, all Scottish Conservative MPs voted uh, to support the withdrawal agreement at the last time of asking on March the 29th. And I think that's because there's a recognition uh, that uh, uh, if you can secure that withdrawal... We have lost signals, so we'll just... Uh, we'll just re-establish that. Uh, just kind of suspend briefly while we re-establish communication. So the meeting is suspended. Do you want to re-establish? Good morning, Mr. Gove. Apologies for uh, that. We lost the connection. Uh, if I could hand you back to the convener. OK, I'm now reconvening the meeting as we've managed to re-establish contact. Uh, I think you were in mid-flow, Mr. Gove. Thank you very much, convener. I, I know I'm just responding to Peter's point um, about uh, the transition period into 2020. Um, and um, what we anticipate is provided Parliament lets us 
that we will uh, have a transition period up to the end of 2020 um, and then we'll be um, fully outside the common fisheries policy then so that we can take advantage of the sea of opportunity that exists. We can achieve that. Uh, another question, a very important question as well, uh, Michael. What will replace the Euro European Maritime Fisheries Fund and how will that be administered in Scotland? And what sort of sums of money might be involved in that fund? Will it be similar to what we are receiving through the EMFF at the moment? I hope there will be more. Um, we want to uh, replace the EMFF with a fund to ensure that coastal communities can invest um, in a way that uh, allows them to take full advantage of the additional opportunities that exist. It was the case that just last December the UK government made available an additional £57 million on top of EMF funding, um, and that was distributed in accordance with EMFF rules so that the Scottish government could make sure that its priorities were properly reflected. And we do want to make sure, as I say, that more money is available, and we also want to respect the, uh, the, the legislative and administrative competences of the Scottish government so that they can spend that money as they think appropriate. But um, as I was discussing in a different committee, that there may be areas like, for example, uh, investment in uh, the uh, redevelopment plans of Fraserburgh Harbour, where the UK government could go above and beyond in making sure that everything that the community there wants to see happen, and the Scottish government, uh, I understand, are sympathetic to, can occur. So my, my approach is absolutely respect the devolution uh, settlement, but where the UK government can go above and beyond in helping Scotland, then we should. Thank you. OK, I'm going to bring in Stuart at this stage. Well, Stuart. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, Mr Gove, it's clear there are um, considerable opportunities for the catching sector to increase uh, the quantum uh, of what they catch, but of course the economic value is delivered through the rather larger processing industry. And ev even as we are at the moment, there are significant uh, vacancy levels in a yes. number of processes, and I'm sure you'll, you'll have heard that. And the, the proposed immigration rules uh, that the UK government are currently engaged with um, set an income uh, floor uh, which is somewhat above the, the level of many of the people who come and work in the industry in the North East. Um, with 30% vacancies in certain uh, processes already, uh, how can the UK government perhaps respond to that to ensure that we are actually able to capture the full economic value of the access to greater catches because the processing sector needs to be party to doing that? It's a very good point. Um, uh, I, I, as you may know, I was um, in Aberdeen just under a fortnight ago and I visited Nolan um, uh, Seafoods, an uh, exemplary uh, fish processing company, and talking to uh, Michael Clark there, um, I appreciated uh, how important it was to have access to a wide range of, of sources of labour. Um, now, while I was there, um, uh, one of the members of the team was someone who uh, uh, had a long time ago worked for my dad. One of the other members of the team was someone who had come over from Poland and who had been trained by my uncle. So I appreciate the vital importance of uh, uh, making sure that you have access to talent, both homegrown and from abroad. And you make a very good point that the Migration Advisory Committee's recommendation that we looked at uh, uh, making sure it was easier to get skilled workers, but pitching uh, the level at which you defined a skilled worker as someone earning more than £30,000 a year wasn't actually uh, uh, responsive to the particular needs, not just of the fish processing sector, but of the food and drink sector overall, or of people who are highly skilled working in processing who will earn less than £30,000, and we must make sure that we have access to that talent. Um, uh, anyone who uh, has seen the, the, the state-of-the-art facilities that somewhere like Newland Seafoods will appreciate that it is absolutely at the cutting edge of technology. But it's also the case that you need skilled manual labour alongside it in order to ensure that high-quality uh, uh, seafood um, is delivered in a way that the, uh, the customer wants. So you're absolutely right. And one of the points that I've made to uh, the Home Secretary and others is that we need to look flexibly in making sure that we interpret what a skilled worker is in lines with the needs of specific industries. Stuart, I may bring you back in, in a minute. I, I, I'd like to bring Maureen in, though, on some of the questions that you'd like to ask Maureen. Uh, yes, thank you, convener. Um, as a result of leaving the EU, the, uh, catching sec the processing sector will now require export health certificates for every batch or every shipment um, mm. of fish, which has an estimated cost of £15 million. Will the UK government pick up that tab? 
Uh, we've, I've said to Fergus that uh, Fergus Ewing, the uh, uh, Cabinet Secretary, uh, that if he uh, lets me know what it is that the Scottish Government needs, the UK Government stands ready to support. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Stuart, do, you, do you want to come back in? With, with, with you? I, I think it's covered, Convener. Okay, to be thank fair. you. Um, then I think we'll move on to the next question. John. John Mason. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Um, it was on, really in the area of frameworks, uh, policy frameworks, common frameworks, uh, all that kind of area. And I think, I mean, initially, can you give us some idea of your thinking as to what will need legislation and what won't? Because some areas, I think, have been working already that the Scottish and UK governments have been cooperating without legislation. So do you anticipate we need a lot of legislation or really not very much? Um, I think it's a case-by-case -case, uh, uh, question. So I think, for example, um, all of us would want to see the internal market um, across the United Kingdom preserved, and that means that uh, we need common frameworks on questions like animal health in order to ensure that um, uh, Scottish farmers and food producers can continue to have uh, both access to the rest of the UK market and also that we all collectively benefit from high reputation that uh, the whole of the UK enjoys. Um, one of the things I'm grateful to the Scottish Government for doing is making uh, their officials um, available for uh, a variety of meetings which have enabled us to put some of the statutory instruments in place, the secondary legislation in place, which ensures that we can uh, uh, deal with whatever um, uh, outcome um, EU exit provides for. Uh, I've also said to the Scottish Government that the agriculture bill we are taking forward, um, uh, we, can, you know, we were always ready to provide additional uh, time so that a schedule could be attached which could uh, make provision for whatever legislative changes the Scottish Government needs. I think the Scottish Government is planning to bring forward its own bill. We'll do everything possible in order to support them and to liaise with them in making sure that uh, it works in the interest of all. I mean, hopefully this can all be done by negotiation and there'll be a good relationship mm -hmm. between you and Fergus Ewing and other parties in the other, four, in the other two countries. Um, <laughs> But, I mean, if, if there was a bit of disagreement around forming a framework, mm. be it legislative or not, how would you see that being resolved? I think it can only satisfactorily be resolved through consensus and agreement. And um, without wanting to be too um, starry-eyed about it, I would say that while um, uh, Fergus Ewing and I um, uh, have disagreements, um, I cannot fault him um, uh, or the Scottish Government um, in the way in which, when it comes to the practical implementation of all the measures required in order to ensure that uh, we retain the benefits of the Union, that uh, Fergus and his team um, have been uh, uh, principled and determined in working in a constructive and pragmatic way. I mean, that's very encouraging. Um, I'm just thinking, though, if there's a situation where um, that, that we couldn't get agreement and, you know, mm. perhaps Scotland because agriculture is so important to us, wanted to have a slightly higher standard than the rest of the UK. I mean, would there be flexibility for that? Or do you think the UK would impose on Scotland uh, the standards it wanted? No, I think that uh, uh, there are some uh, areas where it's absolutely right for different parts of the United Kingdom to want to do their, their own thing. And that's the, uh, the principle behind the devolution settlement, um, which I completely respect. So, again, uh, it... it if, if, for the sake of argument, Fergus or any other cabinet secretary in the future wanted to uh, have particular standards applying in any particular area in Scotland, um, we would do everything possible to facilitate that. Of course, it would be a matter for that cabinet secretary in Scotland's food processing or production sector to decide themselves the extent to which uh, they might, um, uh, you know, there, there might be challenges uh, economically. But I, I would do everything that I could, and I'm sure. Uh, my colleagues across the UK government would do everything that they could in order to make sure that the ambitions of any future cabinet secretary could be met and also the interests of everyone across the United Kingdom could be protected. OK, thank you. Th th thank you, John. Uh, the next question will be from Stuart Stevenson. Stuart. Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, Mr Gove, uh, clearly uh, international treaties are a matter uh, for the UK government to, to, to deal with. And uh, I'm thinking in particular of the World Trade Organization and uh, the rules uh, in specific context to, to agriculture. Um, there's a sort of open uh, disagreement, uh, I think, about uh, uh, 
devolved versus uh, reserved implementation of the rules. Uh, I, I think the, the Scottish Government has put forward some amendments to the UK Agriculture Bill, which the committee has rejected. Is that still on the agenda for ministers to consider uh, responding and taking forward the amendments that the Scottish Government have proposed or close variants uh, to them? Um, you, you, you described the situation perfectly, Stuart. Um, when it comes to uh, notifying WTO about um, uh, the, the level of agricultural support we provide within the amber box and, um, and to make sure that we're WTO compliant, it's the UK government's uh, responsibility for the reasons that you point out. That it, 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 that's the relevant body when it comes to concluding international treaties and satisfying international obligations. But within that, both the Scottish Government and the UK Government recognise that it is for the devolved administrations to decide how the amount that is being uh, allocated is then spent. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, the disagreement um, or difference of views over how to achieve that uh, shouldn't in any way obscure the, the, the basic agreement that we all have on the principles underlying. And we've reached um, a satisfactory arrangement with the Welsh Assembly Government on this issue, and conversations are ongoing with the Scottish Government in order to make sure that our shared ambitions can be met and that any, um, uh, uh, as I say, any difference of interpretation or opinion can be reconciled, whether through amendment or through a, a deeper shared understanding of what both governments want to achieve. Um, I understand the issue around amount, I mean, and that will always be a subject of vigorous debate. I'm more focused on uh, the implementation into domestic law of rules, yes. where yes. Uh, under common agricultural policy, and indeed across a range of policies, uh, the mm -hmm. Scottish Government, as indeed is the case in Wales, have been responsible for the incorporation of the obligations the UK has committed to mm -hmm. uh, into Scottish law, has been the responsibility of the Scottish Parliament uh, working with the Scottish Government. So I think mm. it is in that area that I'm perhaps trying to probe. Um, I'm relatively encouraged by what you've said. So mm. are, you, are you saying to us that you, you, you think we're going to get to a resolution whereby it, 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 it will save work at Westminster if we do it, to be blunt about it, otherwise there's danger that work gets done twice. But recognising mm. that when the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government does this, it is having to do so in relation to the U help the UK meet its international commitments to which it properly has signed up. Yes, that seems very fair. Right, thank you. Um, uh, Mr Cove, just yesterday we had a statement from, um, in the Scottish Parliament from uh, the Minister for Rural Affairs and the Natural Environment saying that the UK government, or the Scottish government, had submitted amendments to the UK Agriculture Bill and that these were holding up the implementation or the construction of a Scottish Government Agriculture Bill. Would you support that assertion that was made yesterday, or is that not true? Um, I, I, can't, I would not support that uh, assertion, actually, no. I mean, one of the things that um, I was struck by uh, at a recent um, meeting that uh, the NFU Scotland held was that uh, the, uh, Johnny Hall, on behalf of the NFU Scotland, said that, uh, in effect, that uh, the Scottish Government uh, had, um, had not provided as much detail about the uh, future of agriculture in Scotland as we had provided south of the border. And there are the, uh, the means and the ability for the Scottish Government to do that. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we said that we would be more than happy to provide a schedule, as we had for the Welsh Assembly Government, to our Agricultural Bill in order to meet all of the needs that Scotland might have in order to put uh, the future of farming on a firmer legislative framework. Uh, so, uh, again, I'm more than happy to uh, consider any suggestions, any thoughts, any recommendations from the Scottish Government, but I certainly don't think it's the case that um, there's been any lack of willingness on the part of the UK Government to help the Scottish Government move on and provide farmers with a greater degree of certainty. OK, and just to, to clarify, uh, there's also some question of whether uh, the Scottish Government needs an agricultural bill in Scotland to continue to make payments in Scotland. Could I clarify your position on that? Um, I think that uh, the Scottish Government could uh, entirely have uh, cooperated with the UK Government on the Agricultural Bill in order to provide that greater degree of certainty. The Scottish Government wants to introduce its own bill, will do everything possible to facilitate that, but it would certainly have been the case that a greater degree of certainty could have been provided if the Scottish Government had opted to use the UK legislation. But again, that is a decision for the Scottish Government. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross, has a follow-up question. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Mr Gove. Um, can you tell me exactly where the agriculture bill is in the system? And is it one of the pieces of legislation that has to be passed before we leave the EU? And if so, is it going to be? Uh, at the moment, the agriculture bill has completed all its common stages apart from the uh, report and third reading stage. And um, uh, in that stage, we can consider um, amendments, including those proposed um, by uh, devolved administrations, which UK parliamentarians um, have put their name to. Um, we need to pass the withdrawal agreement bill first before we can then pass the agriculture bill. Um, and of course, uh, we can formally leave the European Union without the agriculture bill having been passed, because if we do formally leave in accordance with the withdrawal agreement, we'll be entering a transition period. And during that transition period, we have powers uh, necessary in order to continue to provide payment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the next question, which is Richard Lowe. Richard. Continue in regard to the CAP converge, Convergence Review. UK Government has initiated an independent review into the factors that should be considered to make the funding for domestic farm support is fairly allocated to administrations of England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. We all know that Scotland is at the very bottom of the league table of payments per hectare of any farmers in the EU. And Mr Ewing already has told the committee that it was unthinkable that the review would not result in additional money coming to Scotland. Would you agree with that view? Is that right? And if there is additional money, when will it be allocated? Well, because it's an independent review, I can't preempt its conclusions. Um, I'm very grateful to uh, the Scottish Government for uh, recommend an excellent member of the panel in, in Jim Walker, and um, we have representatives from each of the uh, constituent parts of the United Kingdom. And of course, the chair of the review, Lord Bew Donegore, um, is a, a crossbench peer of unimpeachable integrity uh, who, as it happens, lives in Northern Ireland, works in London, um, but hails originally from the Irish Republic. So uh, it's been designed in a way in order to ensure that uh, it is an objective and inclusive look at all of the issues that arose. It was a commitment undertaken by one of my predecessors in this role to set up this review. Uh, uh, the terms of reference have been agreed and um, our work is going on. We know the history. We know that uh, concerns expressed in Scotland that convergence money was made available because of Scotland's unique geography um, and that that money should have been allocated in a different way. Um, uh, as I say, I don't want to preempt the conclusions of that review because I believe that its independence is important. Uh, but of course, uh, whatever the conclusions of that review, uh, the government will take them uh, seriously because we know that hard work is being undertaken by every member of the panel. OK. Um, you've also expressed a desire, you personally have expressed a desire to support hill farmers in Scotland. What does that mean in practical terms and, and, and what, what do you intend to do to ensure that that happens? Well, there are, there are three things I'd say. The first thing is that, um, obviously, uh, the allocation of support um, uh, uh, for farmers across Scotland is a matter for the Scottish Government. And it will be the Scottish Government who will decide, once we leave the EU, um, how it allocates the money that um, uh, we will provide to it. Um, and as you know, it is the case that um, agriculture funding is not subject to the bonnet formula, that because of the particular needs of Scotland and for that matter, Wales and Northern Ireland, um, Scotland enjoys a greater level of support for agriculture and the rural economy than the strict application of the Barnett formula would allow for. And that is a good thing and will not change. Um, so the first thing is uh, we guarantee the funding the Scottish Government decides. The second thing is that within that, we recognise south of the border that uh, upland farmers uh, face particular challenges. They're farming less favoured areas. Uh, the capacity to increase productivity uh, is less, but also they contribute not just to food production, high quality uh, red meat, um, they also contribute to um, maintaining iconic landscapes and enhancing our environment in uh, a, a significant number of ways. And then again, the, what I might call social ecology of parts of this country depend on upland farmers whether it's the Southern Uplands or the Western Highlands, then uh, we, we, we recognise that um, uh, upland farmers, livestock farmers, and indeed um, uh, uh, those who are um, uh, critical to the health of our rural communities uh, do need support in the future. Um, I know that Fergus recognises this. I want to do everything I can to work with him, recognising the uh, competence of the Scottish Parliament in order to help. And I stand ready 
uh, at any stage to do what's required. So can I take from your comments that the, the funding that we presently receive from the EU, uh, once we uh, uh, leave the EU, that the UK Government will ensure that all that funding which Scotland presently gets will be given to Scotland by the UK Parliament? Yes, we've guaranteed to preserve funding uh, right up until 2022. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Maureen. Well, Maureen. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, um, Mr Gove, you'll know that uh, the EU is the largest uh, export destination for uh, Scots lamb. Uh, yet, if we come out of the EU without any deal, they would face 40 to 50 per cent tariffs. So can I ask you, based on the UK's modelling, because we've seen, we've heard some really awful scare stories about there having to be mass slaughter of, of sheep. So, based on the, your government's modelling, what impact will no de deal EU exit have on the Scottish sheep sector? Uh, you are absolutely right, Maureen, to um, point out that uh, the sector of UK farming that will be most affected immediately by the impact of EU exit would be uh, the sheep meat sector. Uh, it is the case that the, the principal export destination for sheep meat from across the United Kingdom uh, is the European Union, France in particular, but other European Union nations as well. Um, we have uh, developed a scheme which, in the event of a no-deal exit, uh, would ensure that we can support the income of sheep farmers. Um, and one of the models that we had in mind was a payment according to the number of breeding ewes that farmers uh, had, which we believe was uh, one of the most effective, though there are uh, uh, potentially uh, other alternative uh, methods of providing support. And um, on that basis, there should not be any need for uh, the types of um, uh, measures that you mention, uh, because it would be the case that the, uh, the income of uh, uh, hill farmers and um, uh, sheep farmers more generally uh, would be protected um, uh, from the initial shock that EUX would bring to the sheep meat sector. Um I thank you for that answer, but could you be a bit more specific about what, what exactly you mean by um, protecting breeding ewes, you said, I think? It's, it's, a, it's a way of making sure that um, we safeguard the income of uh, upland farmers and sheep farmers more generally by making sure that there is a, a payment, additional support for their income. And one of the ways in which we can do that is having an additional payment uh, related to the number of breeding ewes that each farmer has. Now, there are some arguments about different ways in which we can allocate that support. One of the things that I would say is that um, uh, the Scottish Government would have uh, its own ability to decide what method of support it thought was appropriate for sheep farmers. And I would work with the Scottish Government in order to uh, uh, demonstrate how we were applying the scheme south of the border. But if um, the Scottish Government wanted to apply the scheme or any parallel scheme in a different way, then we would look at that. And as I've said to Fergus Ewing, if there are specific requests for additional expenditure that the UK Government can provide in order to help the Scottish Government, um, then we stand ready. And again, this is one of my, um, my strong beliefs, that we respect the, uh, the competence of the Scottish Parliament, we respect the devolution settlement, it's working well. Um, but I don't think there should be any bar to the UK Government stepping in and helping the Scottish Government at any given point with additional resource or additional uh, help. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think that we're stronger together, because the capacity of the UK Government to help the Scottish Government achieve what it wants is one of the virtues of the devolved settlement within our strong United Kingdom. I don't think what you've said, uh, with all due respect, will, will Minister will be very... Uh, welcome by the sheep farmers listening to uh, uh, this but you know given the huge uncertainty that they face mm. in planning uh, their agriculture business as they go forward mm. would it not be wise to give to the farmers the upland farmers the 160 million convergence money that they're due well i tell you uh, a couple of things the first thing there is that uh, it's the it's the uk government that can make resource available to uh, support upland farmers and sheep farmers more generally, and we stand ready to provide that support in any eventuality. Uh, the second thing is that if we want to avoid a no-deal exit, which, as you quite rightly point out, is a particular challenges for the sheep meat sector, one of the best ways of doing that is voting for the deal that the Prime Minister has brought forward, 
Um, all 13 Scottish Conservative MPs have voted for that deal. Uh, other Scottish representatives in the UK Parliament have not done so. Were they to do so, they would provide Scottish farmers with a degree of certainty for the future. And then the third thing about the convergence funding is that uh, the Pew Review is looking at all of the issues concerned there. Uh, and uh, that review, as, as we mentioned earlier, is independent um, and it has a nominee that the Scottish Government put forward, uh, the very excellent Jim Walker. Um, so I, 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 you know, I, I, I think that the, the right thing to do in order to provide farmers with certainty is to vote for the Prime Minister's deal, recognise the strengths that the UK Exchequer can bring in supporting agriculture overall, and then work with the independent view review in order to ensure that we can uh, give uh, not just Scotland's farmers, but farmers across the UK a fair allocation of funding in the future. Uh, there's a few follow-up questions on this. I'd like to bring in John Philly and then Mike Rumbles. Thank you, Kavina. A couple of short supplementaries. Uh, good morning, Secretary of State. Um, Mr Gove, you recently stated, indeed you've repeated again here, that the UK Government should be able to spend additional money in areas of devolved competence, such as Scottish farming and fishing and, and indeed education. You'll be aware that UK Ministers don't have legal powers to interfere in devolved areas unless the UK Parliament chooses to amend the Scotland Act. Is it your intention to undermine Scotland in that way? I would never undermine Scotland. Um, my commitment uh, throughout my political life has been to strengthen Scotland's position. Um, and Scotland is stronger in the United Kingdom. Uh, the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government have been granted additional powers um, uh, by governments led by uh, David Cameron and um, confirmed by Theresa May. And we've done so because we believe in devolution. But we also believe in the union. And we think it's important that uh, uh, where... Uh, the United Kingdom government can support uh, the Scottish government in discharging its responsibilities, that we should do so. So I absolutely respect the legislative competence um, and the administrative autonomy of the Scottish government and think it's a, it's a good thing. But I also think, as I've said to Fergus, if um, the Scottish government needs support at any particular point, then we stand ready to provide it. With respect to education, one of the things that I would say is that um, the education system overall in the United Kingdom benefits from the, uh, uh, the freedom of academics and students to study across the whole of the UK. But one of my concerns, since you mention it, is that over the course of the last few years, uh, that uh, Scotland's schools have been falling behind those in the rest of the United Kingdom, particularly in England. And one of the things that I want to do is to help the Scottish Government and work with John Swinney and others to see if some of the reforms that uh, have helped to raise standards internationally can be introduced in Scottish schools, but of course that's a matter for the Scottish Government. I do think, however, that some of the proposals, since you mentioned education, outlined by Ruth Davidson uh, just under a fortnight ago on how we can improve uh, vocational education, um, seem to me to provide a brighter future for Scotland students, not least when it comes to land-based education as well. Um, and, 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 and Ms Philly, if, if, if I could try and encourage you to stay on the remit of the committee. Um, Absolutely. Uh, uh, I'd be very welcome. Uh, John, I'm going to bring you back in and then yeah. come to Mike Rumble. Yeah. So one yeah. more from you, John. F forgive me, uh, Convener. I did stroke, stroke out the words and in education, but I, I went on to say them. Yes, it is farming and fishing that we're concerned with here, Secretary of State. And, and I wonder, I, I mean, I have to tell you, I take no reassurance, none whatsoever in what you say. And, and if Scotland's devolution settlement can be treated so lightly, and that's how I take much of what you've said, mm. Importantly, how can we be sure that our interests in matters like high agriculture and environmental standards mm. will be respected in any future UK trade deals? Well, I think the, the, the first thing to say is that I, I disagree with your, um, uh, your initial premise. I can't see how uh, the UK government saying it respects the devolution settlement and it wants to provide additional resource and work for the Scottish government in order to put the interests of uh, Scotland citizens first is in, is in any way undermining the devolution settlement. It is reinforcing the devolution settlement. What undermines the devolution settlement is an argument for separation and uh, independence for Scotland, which would mean that the powers that the Scottish Parliament uh, currently has... So you know better than the Scottish Government in devolved matters? No. I, you know better I, than the Scottish uh, Parliament in devolved matters? Uh, no, but I think that... Well, that's uh, the issue. Uh, 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 I... I I uh, have repeated to this committee, as I did to earlier committees, um, that I respect the devolution settlement. Um, one of the concerns that I, I, I have is that uh, sometimes uh, there are opportunities that the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government have uh, to improve things where, while I completely respect the devolution settlement, I'm not sure that all the powers that the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government have are being used in, uh, in the right way. 
Now, that's a matter for the Scottish Government, but I thought it was very interesting, for example, that recently um, uh, uh, Johnny Halls from the NFU Scotland pointed out that the Scottish Government has not provided the same degree of uh, clarity and uh, detail and future vision that the uh, UK Government has when it comes to farming and agriculture and the environment in England. Now, that is a, uh, a decision that the Scottish Government must take about what the approach is that it believes is right. But, you know, as someone who um, uh, uh, loves Scotland and wants to see Scotland succeed and wants to see an effective Scottish Government, again, uh, when uh, voices like that of Johnny's from the NFU Scotland are raised, I listen with interest, but I absolutely respect the devolution settlement. The key question is, let's make it work. And one of the ways in which we can make it work is by no longer having a divisive debate about separation, independence, another referendum and a separate currency, but instead using the powers that... Mr. The Gove, there's nothing the more Parliament divisive have. than Brexit. Nothing more divisive. I, 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 I don't want this uh, to become a, a political discussion. I'd like to try and get back to the questions where we were. So I'm going to uh, ask Mike to ask his question on this before moving on to Jamie Green. Thank you, thank you, Convener, and good morning, Mr. Gove. I just want to follow up your response to a previous question from Maureen Watt about a, a no-deal Brexit and the implications of that for Scotland's agricultural industry. Now, you are... I, I know your position. You, you want a, a deal. You want all your colleagues to vote for a deal to get this through. But assuming that that doesn't happen and the alternative is a no-deal Brexit... Um, I think you've accepted already that, I'm not sure to put it, don't want to put words in your mouth, but in my view, certainly, a no-deal Brexit would be devastating for Scotland's agricultural industry with the tariffs that we've already mentioned, for instance, with the, with the, with the sheep sector. So are you doing all you can as the minister responsible for the UK's agricultural industry in the UK cabinet to argue whatever happens, I know what your preference is, but whatever happens, we don't leave with a no deal and have the subsequent devastation of our agricultural industry. That's, in my view, I would hope would be your, your position. Could you confirm whether that it is? Um, uh, Mike, thank you for your question. And, um, and one of the things is that even though we come from uh, different parties, um, uh, we find ourselves agreeing on a lot. And I do agree with you. I'm not, not quite the language. I can understand why you do use it. I do think that if we left without a deal, um, that there would be uh, real risks and challenges mm. for the whole of the UK economy, and in particular for agriculture yeah. and farming, and in particular, as Maureen and you have pointed out, for some of the more vulnerable sectors like um, uh, upland farmers and the sheep meat sector. Now, I think that um, uh, we can, the UK government and the Scottish government, can put in place measures, and we have put in place measures to mitigate the impact of that. But that one of the reasons why I'm strongly advocating a deal is that I do recognise that while the UK could get through uh, uh, the uh, initial turbulence that no deal would cause, um, none of us would want that turbulence uh, because of the impact that it would have on the people that you represent. But the point I'm making is, with your particular responsibilities, yes. mm. do, you, do you not feel obliged to fight the corner in the Cabinet to prevent whatever else happens, a no deal Brexit? Um, I have, um, again, made the case and will make the case on any platform that I'm given that the best answer uh, is a deal. And uh, when I spoke to the NFU conference um, uh, in February um, in Birmingham, um, I made the point then that uh, there were real challenges with no deal. Uh, during the course of uh, parliamentary debate in the UK Parliament, when the Prime Minister was indisposed for health reasons and I stood in for her, I also explained there some of the, the difficult consequences that no deal uh, would uh, bring about. And I and um, my colleague and our mutual friend, David Mandel, makes the same arguments. One thing, though, that I, I, I have to acknowledge is that it is one of a number of possible scenarios for which we have to be prepared. And while it is very, very far from being the scenario that I would prefer, it's my responsibility uh, to make sure that we are ready for uh, whatever is the, uh, is the outcome of this process. Uh, OK. And the next question is from uh, Jamie Green. Jamie. Uh, thank you, convener, and uh, good morning, Mr. Gove. Um, I'd like to uh, expand further on the subject we touched on earlier around uh, access to the labour markets. I think it's quite an important area for agriculture. Um, notwithstanding the issues around the fishing industry, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about the soft fruits industry and other forms yeah. of uh, seasonal workers and farming. Um, I appreciate that uh, matters of immigration policy are a matter for your colleague uh, in the Home Office. However, 
Uh, I suspect you have a strong interest in this, this matter. Um, could you give me uh, 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 and the committee an update on how the industry is responding to the uh, pilot scheme for migrant workers? Uh, and I think we could probably approach this in two ways. One is uh, to ensure access uh, of labour from within the EU, but also from outside the EU as well, which will uh, you know, not, not necessarily be impacted by Brexit in the same way. Yeah. Uh, that would be a, very helpful to get an update on that. Um, there's been an enthusiastic take-up of places on our seasonal agricultural workers pilot um, and we've been recruiting, as you quite rightly point out, from just beyond the EU, from uh, places like the Ukraine um, and Moldova um, and uh, uh, the, the pilot at the moment um, is smaller than some uh, would have wanted but I think the enthusiastic take-up helps us to make the case for the potential expansion of numbers that come in through the seasonal agricultural workers scheme. One of the arguments that's made is that while the the seasonal agricultural workers pilot for, for, for from outside the EU is, is a good thing. It's still the case that we remain in the EU, and if the withdrawal agreement bill is passed, it will still be the case that during the transition period, even though we're out of the EU, free movement will still continue for a period, and that means that workers from Romania, Bulgaria and elsewhere can still come and work in the UK. Um, now, of course, uh, uh, as countries like Romania and Bulgaria themselves become wealthier, so more of the individuals in those countries who've worked in the UK might want to uh, uh, work in their own home countries. And as the, the value of sterling in the immediate aftermath of the referendum uh, fell a wee bit, so that meant that um, some of the earnings, even though it was obviously a help to exporters, some of the earnings of some of those workers uh, in relative terms diminished, and that, that also had an impact. So we need to keep all these things in balance, but I do think that um, we, we need to have an open approach. And I also think that... Um, the soft fruit sector, which is so important in Angus and Perthshire, um, does need to make sure it has access to all the labour it needs. Uh, uh, thank you for that um, detailed response. And I think it's fair to say that the needs of soft fruit growers in Angus is perhaps not dissimilar to those in Ashford. So I think there's a, uh, yes. a UK-wide uh, issue to look at. Um, I mean, just that you, okay. touched, you touched on the numbers there. And I think it's fair to say that what industry are saying to us is that they're looking for... Uh, you know, regions in the tens of thousands in terms of the number of seasonal yes. workers they need to, to pick the fruit that, that, that's required. Um, do, do, you, do you think there's scope for uh, uh, expansion of the pilot scheme? Um, and also, uh, there have been one or two uh, anecdotal pieces of evidence that there may have been some, some delays in processing the, the visas for some, and I'm hoping that's maybe something you can take up with the Home Office to ensure that there's sort of timely processing of, of those visas to make sure we get people on the ground doing the job they need to do as soon as possible. I certainly will, and thank you for uh, bringing it to my attention. And yes, I'm open-minded about how the scheme might develop in the future, um, and uh, one of the reasons that we were able to get the scheme in place uh, so quickly was uh, because of the advocacy of Kirsten Hare, who uh, uh, did a brilliant job in uh, making sure that the Home Office appreciated the vital importance of, of having a pilot scheme. Um, and um, in conversation with Kirsten, I'm hoping to see her and um, visit um, Angus later this week, um, we will keep under review the evidence on the ground about what may be required in the future. And finally, if I may, I, can I add, add my commendation to the work of my, my colleague, Kirstein, and, and indeed any MP from across the UK who's working on behalf of their constituents in this subject. Um, can I also maybe probe your thoughts on how we could uh, grow uh, a local workforce for this type of, of work? I appreciate that we have been traditionally relying on people from the parts of the EU, which you mentioned. Uh, that's, that uh, has, has changed its course, and we're now looking beyond the borders of Europe uh, for uh, seasonal workers, but do you think there's a role that, that, that both of Scotland's governments could play in, in trying to encourage uh, people uh, who already live uh, and work here, indeed, to, to take this up as a, a potential career path or to look at it as an employment opportunity? And, and what do you think we could do to, to help uh, grow uh, that workforce? I think you're absolutely right. I think that um, uh, we need to consider how we make... Um, uh, uh, agriculture overall, um, uh, an even more attractive profession. Um, um, uh, one of the things that I, I want to do is to work with Scotland's Rural College and others in order to make sure that um, attractive career paths are open to people who uh, want to work on the land and want to work in agriculture. Um, I also think that it's the case that um, if we look at organisations like the James Hutton Institute, some of the work that they're doing is scientifically exciting, but also holds open the prospect of uh, growers being able to uh, produce soft fruit, salad vegetables and other uh, fresh produce 
in exciting new ways. Um, and as technology advances, so the opportunity for uh, enterprising and innovative Scots to make a career in agriculture and in growing increases. So I think it's important that both governments work together in order to support um, uh, those at the cutting edge of innovation um, and also to take account of the specific concerns of those people who are already making a success of um, uh, uh, producing some of the highest quality produce in the world. Thank you. We're going to move on to the next question to Stuart Stevenson. I'm, I'm just conscious of trying to get all committee members in. Um, so uh, short questions, short answers are always good, I say, but uh, I'll leave it to committee members. Uh, Stuart. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask a narrow point. Other colleagues will ask about uh, international trade and about geographical indicators uh, <laughs> after I've asked my question. I'm, I'm just simply looking at uh, the, the United States trade report, the negotiating position uh, for a trade deal. Uh, in particular, they want to bring whiskey in that hasn't been held in bond in three years. Um, we do that under the 1915 Immature Spirits Act that my father's cousin was responsible for in Asquith's government. Um, and uh, the, the issues about uh, food hygiene um, and the use of hormones. And I think a lot of that is in our environment uh, down to public health concerns. And we know that the United States is 27th in perinatal deaths, leading in opioid addiction, obesity, huge problems. So they are not a leader in that. Where we very strongly resist in any negotiations um, the, the, the imposition of the kind of ideas the United States is putting and make sure that the jurisdictions across the, the UK uh, are involved in uh, setting the terms of any debate on this subject. Um, I think it's fair to say that the United States' initial ask in these trade negotiations is probably more designed to appeal to aspects of uh, the domestic audience in America than it is to work for us. That's fine. Thank you, Camilla. <laughs> OK, uh, and Jamie, you, you, I think you, you have a question there as well. Uh, thank you, Camilla. It's, it's me again. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I, I, it's interesting. I, I also sit on the uh, Europe Committee and the Parliament, and we've been uh, doing a lot of work on this in terms of the role of the devolved administrations in future negotiations and future trade deals, uh, both bilaterals and, and otherwise. Um, how do you think the uh, process uh, could go, given that I think that agriculture and fisheries specifically are very pertinent issues when we, when we are negotiating uh, trade deals with other countries such as uh, New Zealand, the US, uh, etc. Um, what role do you think the devolved administrations can and should play in terms of the process of sitting around the table before the negotiations begin and talking about the, the, the needs and wants of the various constituent parts of the UK and to ensure that those are all reflected as a negotiation position uh, when you go into that, that conversation uh, with the other side? Um, I think it's critical, and I think your approach is absolutely the right one. What we want to do is to make sure that the negotiating mandate that we have in those trade negotiations is as widely understood as possible, that we involve people from across the United Kingdom, um, and that we take advantage of the expertise and commitment of the devolved administrations. During those negotiations, it has to be the UK government, because it's an international treaty at the end of it, um, that uh, is in the room. But I think it is absolutely critical that we make sure that any trade agreement works for all parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, thank you for that. And I appreciate that uh, uh, environments such as the uh, uh, JMCs, which are designed to, to, to facilitate those conversations, do you think there are any other practical measures that, that the governments could participate in to perhaps uh, get over any um, you know, disagreement in, in strategy or any uh, formalised process in which the various needs of each of the, the governments uh, have. And I think, uh, you know, the, the Welsh government may have a view on, on a certain strategy, the Scottish government another, and indeed uh, yourselves in a different direction. How do you square that circle before you go into that room to ensure there's a strong sing single unified voice negotiating? We do everything we can in order to make sure that um, uh, every sector that has particular interests is effectively represented. So recently, um, uh, representatives of Plaid Cymru raised the particular uh, impact of um, our relationship with South Korea in trade terms for Quelks exports. And, and it, it, it's critically important for parts of uh, Wales that we uh, maintain good access, um, and we are determined to, uh, to take account of that. Um, with respect to uh, Scotland, um, two of the UK's most important exports are uh, salmon and whisky, 
um, and we want to make sure that the high standards that uh, we maintain are uh, uh, in no way undermined. And of course, um, uh, I am happy to meet with representatives not just of the Scottish Government, who have a critical role to play, but also other uh, members of the Scottish Parliament and representatives of individual sectors. So if when, for example, I go to the Royal Highland Show at Ingleston, it's an opportunity for me to hear direct from people in aquaculture and agriculture about what their uh, particular concerns might be about future trade arrangements, but also their hopes, and to incorporate that into uh, the UK Government's approach. Th thank you very much. look forward to seeing you at the show. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next question will be from Colin. Colin Smith. You know, can, can I turn to the, the issue of, of, of geogra geographical indications and access to, to markets, Mr Gove? GIs are obviously clearly important to, to, to products such as Scotch whisky, as you mentioned. C can you tell us how the, the UK's GIs will be treated on the EU market in the event of a no-deal Brexit at the end of October? Uh, it will be the case that um, under EU law they will continue, that is the EU, to uh, respect our geographical indications. And in, in terms of going forward and, 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 and negotiating any trade deals, would continued protection of UK GIs in, in the EU market be a red line for negotiations with the EU? Uh, and would the continued protection be a red line in negotiations with the United States on any trade deal? We are absolutely committed to making sure that the benefits of geographical indications are uh, continue to be available to producers across the United Kingdom. Okay. Uh, just a final point. I mean, do you think that a, a no-deal Brexit or, or a deal that includes a permanent customs union would be the best for Scottish produce, such as Scotch whisky, in terms of access to markets? Uh, well, one of the interesting things about whisky is that um, uh, it doesn't have um, uh, tariff barriers. Um, but one of the things I would say is that uh, the best deal, I suppose you'd expect me to say this, is the one that the Prime Minister has negotiated, which manages to ensure that we have uh, uh, tariff and quota-free access for goods and for agri-foods, while at the same time having an independent trade policy when it comes to services. I do. Just a quick question. I would also like to commend my colleagues Deirdre Brock and Emma Harper for all their hard work that they've done on the PGI status. Um, Mr Gove, the UK government stated that in the event of a no deal, existing holders of protected status should prepare to reapply to the EU for protection and use of the EU logo. Is this still the case? And if so, will it involve a cost? And if so, who is going to pay for that? Uh, the UK government stands ready to make sure that all uh, uh, additional unnecessary costs which business bears we take into account. Sorry, can you just, what, what's the, the, the difference between an unnecessary and a necessary cost? Well, again, we will look pragmatically at each of the individual challenges that uh, business has to bear. Um, and of course, uh, you know, one of the things that um, I mentioned earlier is that uh, we are seeking to do everything we can to avoid a, uh, a no-deal exit, but we are also uh, capable of making sure that the impacts of a no-deal exit in particular sectors and for particular uh, producers are mitigated. So, just just really quickly, so picking up the bill for the health certificates in the fish sector, giving compensation for the sheep sector, and now money for protected status, do we have a final cost for all this? Uh, well, one of the things, of course, is that if we leave the European Union, we'll no longer be paying into the European Union, so we will uh, benefit net to the equivalent of at least £10 billion a year. OK, I'm going to move on to the next question, which is John Mason. Uh, thanks very much, convener. Um, the, my question is around the question of the border and how well prepared we are for, um, for an exit. Now, I think there was a report from the National Audit Office, which was in October 18, and I realise that was when they were expecting that March 19 would be the exit date. Uh, so things may have changed. Uh, it says things like DEFRA has done well in very difficult circumstances. And again, what really matters now, though, is that DEFRA accelerates its medium-term planning for the withdrawal agreement eh, while finalising its contingency plans. Can you give us any kind of update as to where we are with borders and border controls and so on? Yes, the, the, the National Audit Office report, and thank you very much for your very fair summary of it, um, uh, thanked uh, DEFRA officials for their hard work, but acknowledged that there was much more to do. That report was very helpful in marking our homework and telling us where uh, we had to try harder, and we have. And uh, 
We were ready if it had been the case that we had left in March 29th. We had the IT systems and the uh, uh, other organisational preparations in place. Of course it would have been the case uh, that there would have been, as I mentioned earlier, some turbulence and some bumps in the road. And if indeed we do leave on October the 31st without a deal, there will be some turbulence and some bumps in the road. But we are confident that uh, uh, DEFRA, along with other government departments, has taken appropriate steps to mitigate those risks. I mean, one of the things they specifically said was that uh, the border would be, uh, some of the controls at the border would be less than optimal, uh, which does kind of, you know, send up at least some uh, amber lights, if not red ones. Is the suggestion that uh, because we've been in the EU, that we would carry on in quite a kind of more relaxed way after uh, we leave, and um, then things would gradually tighten up? And, and if that is the case, are we also expecting the EU countries to be equally relaxed in our exports to them? Well, that is a very big question and a, uh, and a very important one. Our approach, the UK government's approach, is uh, uh, continuity uh, 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 wherever possible. So we do not expect the day after a no deal exit, if it were to occur, that suddenly France, Germany or Austria would lower their animal welfare or environmental standards when exporting to the, uh, the UK. So we can have confidence that we um, uh, could continue to allow exports from uh, EU countries into this country without the need for uh, the same level of checks that we might apply to non-EU countries. Now, the EU has said that in the event of a no-deal exit, they would insist on not just the uh, common external tariff being applied to the UK, but also a, a battery of SPS and other checks. And that would mean that UK exports, for example, would have to go through a border inspection post. Now, it's within the EU's power to apply those rules with a greater or lesser degree of flexibility, um, and that is one of the um, known unknowns, as someone once said, um, about um, uh, a no-deal exit. To what extent would it be the case that, uh, for example, the French government would prioritise speed of flow over um, uh, the most, uh, what's the word, uh, comprehensive checking uh, possible? Um, and there were lots of signals from people within the French uh, government that they would prioritise speed of flow, but we had to take into account the fact that um, not everything might necessarily be in place to guarantee that. Because presumably the, the fear for our farmers is that, uh, that we allow French and other food to come into our country, and, and it probably is of a, a perfectly good standard, but it can compete here with Scottish and other uh, UK products. Whereas if our products are delayed at the border, some of which would not survive more than a few days, eh, and they, they are held up, um, then they would not be able to compete within the European countries. Uh, that is a concern, um, but it is, uh, I say two things. The first thing is that um, in terms of fair competition, um, we published a schedule, uh, an indicative schedule of the tariffs that we would apply um, in the event of a no-deal exit in order to make sure that we had appropriate protection for uh, UK agriculture, while also at the same time balancing the need for uh, price stability for the consumer. Um, and it is also the case that there would be an interest for, for example, French consumers in making sure that uh, the shellfish that they enjoy, and which is provided in abundance from, um, from Scotland and from Cornwall, gets onto French plates and into French restaurants as quickly as possible. So there'd be a strong commercial incentive from uh, uh, people across Europe to ensure the unimpeded supply of produce that they could not themselves uh, quickly replicate from any other source. Thank you. And the last question uh, will be from Peter Chapman. Peter. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Mr Gove, in the event of a no-deal exit scenario, you recently published a tariff schedule, which, in my opinion, meant there was a great lack of fairness in the tariffs on our exports of food to the EU were in general much higher than tariffs you are proposing to level on imports. Now, this would have a catastrophic effect on our agricultural or our, our farming industry. Surely there should be parity of tariffs for exporting and importing to be, to, for, for that to be a fair system. So my, my, my question is, will you reconsider your, that, that approach to tariffs? Uh, well, we, we, the, the approach to tariffs, as I mentioned to, to John, was designed to do two things, to protect the most vulnerable sectors in agriculture and at the same time to safeguard prices for uh, consumers. So some of the most vulnerable sectors we discussed earlier, the particular vulnerability of the sheep meat sector, would have exactly the same protection 
um, outside the EU as they do inside the EU. It's also the case that other uh, red meat sectors like beef would also enjoy appropriate protection. Um, but we also believe that it was right to have an approach overall towards tariffs um, that was um, uh, le led to a great degree of liberalisation. But if you look at the agriculture sector and compare it with other sectors of our economy, our approach in a no-deal scenario would be to protect agriculture much more energetically and vigorously than any other sector for the reasons that we both well know. Yeah. Can I just come back? I, I mean, to be honest, I don't accept that because, you know, the levels of protection for sheep meat are, are, are similar. But for everything else, yeah. basically everything else, the, the tariff uh, rates for imports are much less than the tariff rates for our farmers exporting. So how can that be fair? It, can be, it certainly would help to keep uh, food prices down, but it certainly would do nothing to uh, allow us to have a, an agricultural industry that would, would have any kind of secure future going forward. Uh, there are other ways in which we can support the agriculture sector as well. There are, there are ways in which we can make sure that farmers um, in some of the more exposed sectors are, are helped through those initial challenges and ways in which we can make sure that uh, we're investing in improved agricultural productivity overall. But I think one of the things, Peter, that both of you and I agree is that, uh, well, we must deliver Brexit. That's what folk across the United Kingdom voted for. Um, a no-deal Brexit would pose particular challenges. And in that context... Um, one of the things that we need to do is to work together across the United Kingdom, if that is the outcome of this Brexit process, in order to make sure that um, uh, farmers and food producers across the UK are protected. One of the best ways we can do that is by making sure that they, the shared muscle of all the countries of the United Kingdom working together uh, helps us through whatever challenges we face. OK. OK, and unfortunately we, we've come to the end of our time, so I'd like to thank Mr Gove for, for all the evidence you've given to the committee. And we are now going to suspend the meeting to allow the Cabinet Secretary and his officials to arrive for the next item. Therefore, I suspend the meeting for no more than five minutes.
Uh, I'd now like to re reconvene this meeting of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. We are now on to agenda item five. Um, I would like to welcome, uh, uh, sorry, I should say before we're doing this, this is our second uh, stage two consideration session of the South Scotland Enterprise Bill. I'd like to welcome the Cabinet Secretary and his uh, supporting officials. So, Cabinet Secretary Frosier, welcome. Uh, to this meeting. I'd also like to welcome Karen Jackson, the South of Scotland Economic Development Team team leader, Sandra Reid, the Bill team leader, uh, Felicity Callan, the Scottish Government Legal Directorate, and Fraser Goff, the Parliamentary Council for the Scottish Government. Uh, I'd also like to welcome Finlay Carson to this meeting. And we are going to start off from uh, where we'd left off. So, I'm going to do that by calling Amendment 42 in the name of John Mason in a group on its own. John Mason to move and speak to Amendment 42. John. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, as members will see in Section 14, headed annual report, it says that the South of Scotland Enterprise must, after each financial year, prepare and publish a report on its activities during the year and send a copy to the report of the report to Scottish ministers. Uh, my amendment would add that uh, that report must also be uh, laid before this Parliament. Um, saying that the report must be laid before Parliament will ensure that members are informed regularly about the agency's activities and that the agency is accountable for its actions. It therefore allows members to build up a picture of activity over a period of time. I think this is standard practice for most non-departmental public bodies and brings the new agency's reporting requirements into line with those of the existing enterprise agencies. So I think this is a step just to increase transparency, and I hope members would support this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Peter, you wanted to speak on that. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks, convener. Uh, I think Amendment 42 it increases, only increases accountability of the board. This is something we would expect to see from any public service body, and we appreciate adding it to the face of the bill is a correct thing to do, so I will be supporting this amendment. Thank you. Um, no one else wants to speak. So, Cabinet Secretary, would you like to add anything? To that? Yes, thank you, Convener. I'm, I'm pleased to support Amendment 42, which will bring the new enterprise agencies' reporting requirements into line with those of the existing enterprise agencies. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. So, now I ask John Mason to wind up and to press or withdraw the amendment. Be pressed. Um, okay, thank you. Therefore, the question is that <coughs> Amendment 42 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, the question now is that section 14 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I now would like to call amendment 43 in the name of Colin Smith group with amendment 44. Colin Smith to move amendment 43 and speak to both amendments in the group. Colin. Th thank you, convener. Amendment 43 in my name gives ministers a, a duty to set up a framework to ensure the new agency interacts effectively uh, with uh, the many other existing bodies um, uh, covering the south of Scotland. As members know one of the, the big concerns raised with the committee by stakeholders in the south of Scotland was the question of how the agency will interact with other bodies working in the region. It's an issue that, that, that does dominate the views of many businesses and organisations that I speak to regularly in the south of Scotland, uh, and that is presumably why members agreed to recommend in our stage one report uh, an amendment to that effect be brought forward. The new agency will be operating alongside Council, Scottish Enterprise, Skills Development Scotland, Scottish Funding Council, Visit Scotland, whatever governments is put in place regarding the borderlands, growth deal, uh, and so on. Uh, in practical terms, we need to ensure there isn't any duplication or gaps in the work being done and ensure there's clarity on who is responsible for what. More broadly, we need to ensure there's collaboration and coherence across the bodies and I think the new agency has an absolutely crucial leadership and coordinating role to play uh, in this regard. Uh, I think the existing duties set out in the Community Empowerment Act um, do require cooperation at, uh, but that's at local authority level. It's important to point out this new agency is cross local authority uh, and community planning partnerships uh, are, are not sufficient to cover the need to coordinate this work. Um, so I'm happy to move uh, my amendment 43 uh, and also amendment 44 um, which is a a, a consequential amendment. Thank you. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you. I, I, I think I'm one of two constituency MSPs whose constituency crosses the HIE and uh, Scottish Enterprise boundary, so I, I, I see the two. And, and 
in particular, I see how they work together. Uh, and, and in particular, they don't work together because there's something on the face of a piece of legislation, as far as I'm aware, uh, but by um, in concordats and uh, formal agreements, and I suspect that may be a better way. However, more specifically looking at the way in which uh, Colin Smith has uh, constructed his amendment, um, I, I, I wonder if the phrase which operate in the south of Scotland is a bit restrictive, because I think there are, there are public authorities whose effects are in the south of Scotland, but don't necessarily fulfil the test of operating in the south of Scotland. So I, I think there is a wee issue, and Colin may be able to address this in his concluding remarks. Um, and then that further is qualified by, and which have functions relevant to the aims of Scot South Scotland enterprise. I suspect that is, again, more restrictive than it would be likely to be the case uh, to the agreement that I would expect would be reached uh, by the new uh, body and whatever bodies uh, it is relevant for them to have agreements <coughs> with and cooperate. Um, I'm going to listen to the debate, but that, that, that uh, places me in a position where I'm not sure I should support this at this stage. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, Jamie Green. Jamie. Uh, thank you, convener, and good, good morning to the current secretary and his team. Um, can I... Uh, it's an interesting uh, amendment. Uh, can I thank Colin Smith for bringing this forward? I think he raises an important issue in the premise behind this amendment. It is something that the committee discussed and indeed reflected on in stage one. Uh, I think one of the conundrum that we face is the, how the new agency will uh, work with other bodies and agencies. We had a very lengthy discussion last week about the aims of the agency and the areas of uh, portfolio interest that it will reflect on. We looked at transport, digital connectivity and so on. Uh, I think on, on the face of it, I have I support the, the principle of what Ms. Smith is trying to achieve, but I do have some questions from that perhaps you can reflect in and is summing up and subject to his response I think may uh, influence uh, uh, certainly how I or, or indeed some of my colleagues might vote on this. Um, can Colin Smith provide comfort to me that this amendment does not place any additional duties on the new agency to deliver the functions of any other agency which operates in the south of Scotland or indeed as it stated something Mr Stevenson said which have functions relevant to the aims of the agency. I uh, appreciate the final aims yet to be agreed after stage three. Uh, so I'm looking for some comfort that that's not placing an additional duty to deliver things that other agencies should be delivering. Can I also ask him to clarify what cooperates and coordinates activities with? I think it's a, a valid statement, but it, it still is in itself a vague statement. How do you define what cooperation and coordination is? And indeed, how do you then define what the consequences of not cooperating and coordinating is? I'm slightly worried that either the board of the agency, the agency, or indeed the ministers themselves will, have, will face some recourse if it's deemed that they have not been cooperating and coordinating the work of other agencies, work which is largely outside of their control. Um, and I think finally, I would say that if, uh, I think, if, if would the member be willing to, to work uh, with other members of the committee to perhaps tighten the wording if we feel that this doesn't quite express in technical levels the premise of what he's trying to achieve. Would he work with us to ensure that at stage three this is a watertight amendment and in response to that uh, would receive our support? Okay, thank you. Uh, John, John Mason. Uh, thanks, convener. Uh, well, really building, I think, on what uh, Jimmy Green said and I share some of his concerns about, about these two words, cooperates and coordinates. I mean, my understanding of cooperates is if there's three of us together and we're cooperating, we're all equal and we're working together to find a solution. My understanding of the word coordinates is if there's three of us together, a, the person who's coordinating is trying to, a, is, is taking a lead. And Mr. Smith used the word a, leadership, a, which suggests that the South of Scotland enterprise body is somehow over the local authorities. Now, that may not be his intention, but that's the way I'm reading that, and that would suggest to me that the local authorities' autonomy would be undermined. Thank you, John. Uh, Mike, Mike Rumbles. Just a short comment. I mean, the duties to ensure the South of Scotland enterprise cooperates and coordinates activities with other Scottish public 
authority is, is, is clear. I mean, that's the whole point. Do we really, I mean, I'm relaxed about it, but I have to say, do we really need the Scottish Government to set out regulations to do it? I mean, it seems a bit of an overkill to me. Thank you, Mike. Uh, John Finney, John. Um, thank you. Um, like others, I, I, I share some of the concerns, and I, I don't doubt that it's entirely well-meaning. I, I, I do have uh, two particular public bodies, public authorities in that area and there, and, and I can't think of an example at, at this particular juncture, but if the two local authorities took diametrically opposed positions in relation to an issue, where does the co coordination and cooperation come around that and what additional pressures it might be placed on the new agency? Thank you. Thank you. And the last person indicated they want to speak is Finlay, Finlay Carson. Uh, thanks, Convener. I share the concerns of, of uh, a lot of the uh, committee <coughs> members, but I, I think it's a really important amendment to bring forward uh, with, with some changes. Uh, we want to ensure that uh, money allocated from the uh, to the board is not used in areas where uh, other public bodies actually have the, 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 the funding to deliver that, whether that's Funding Scotland or Skills Development Scotland or uh, Visit Scotland, whatever, we want to ensure that there's some accountability, that there is cooperation uh, to ensure that the money's coming out of the right pot. There was some concerns uh, surrounding that the 6.6 .6 million that was allocated to the colleges and uh, Dumfries and Galloway in the south of Scotland, where, whereas this was going to be greatly welcomed, the funding, uh, there was an argument that some of that funding should possibly have come from uh, Funding Scotland. So I think this will enable uh, us to hold board members to account to ensure that the money's actually been allocated from the right pot of money. Thank you, Mr Carson. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Hey, thank you, uh, Convener. I've listened with, with great interest to, to the discussion. Um, firstly, I, I do agree with the principle, and Mr Smith is to be commended for bringing this forward, the principle that it's essential that uh, a South of Scotland enterprise works closely with other public bodies across the South of Scotland. Um, I, I would go further. I would suggest it's equally important that the agency engages with businesses, uh, edu education institutions, um, communities, public bodies that, as has been pointed out uh, by Mr Stevenson, who may not be operating in the south of Scotland, but whose influence and whose decisions have an impact. I also cognizant of, fa of the fact that Claudia Beamish moved a similar amendment uh, about a duty to cooperate with environmental bodies. And I say the same thing. Of course, there needs to be cooperation with all relevant stakeholders. Um, so so I, I agree that the principle is correct, and I, I think every member has agreed with that. The question really is how, how in practice that objective is best secured, I think and whether in particular primary legislation is the best way to achieve that. The um, amendment as drafted a convener says Scottish ministers must make regulations. Now, that would confer powers on Scottish ministers, um, which we do not seek. We prefer it to leave it to the judgment of the people who are appointed following due process as the chair and the elected members and their staff to work in the way that we all wish. So I don't wish a prescriptive approach from the Scottish ministers to have that power. I don't really see why it would be necessary uh, or actually desirable, but we do absolutely, Mr Smith, want to encourage the culture of cooperation. I think we have seen that culture exist in SOSEP, in the partnership under Professor Griggs's chair chairmanship. And indeed, from what I've seen, and I've had the privileged position of being involved in many of the meetings and discussions, that partnership is working extremely well. Um, now, of course, we have no idea who the office bearers will be, but that culture, I hope, will, will carry on, culture of cooperation. SOSEP has brought together public sector organisations between private third and education sector and forge good working relations. And I think it's right to record that. And I, I think actually Professor Griggs is about to engage on another 32 public meetings across the area, which is a quite outstanding stint. Uh, those of us who've been involved in public meetings know that that is a bit of a shift, uh, putting it in non-ministerial parlance. So, um, you know, I, I'm sure, convener, that these relationships will continue with the establishment of the enterprise agency, and rightly so. There, there are, and I want to try and be helpful here, because I think there's a mood of, 
trying to find a, a way through that's positive, and uh, Mr. Mr. Green expressed that, as well others, Mr. Finney. Um, and first of all, I think I should uh, have discussions with the local authorities to see what they want uh, in relation to this and have an opportunity to do so prior to stage three. I think that would be useful. And Mr. Finney has postulated what happens if there's a disagreement between the local authorities and how would this duty impact on that? It's a very fair point, I think, to make. And, um, uh, uh, and there we are. Um, secondly, you know, I can ab give an absolute assurance that ministerial letters of guidance um, uh, are used here as an extra statutory mechanism. Um, and these, uh, I've given a commitment to the committee to write before stage three convener in detail about what the initial letter of guidance to the new body should contain. And I wanted today in response to this to say that I guarantee that, that, um, that my intention would be that if this bill is passed by parliament and we get to the stage of the initial letter of guidance, that would cover the issues of the duty to cooperate with all relevant parties, and that would be in the letter of guidance. Uh, and I think that would be, uh, seem to me to be the correct procedural way to achieve an objective which we all share. Secondly, the Enterprise and Skills Strategic Board focuses strongly on alignment. And of course, the chair of the new agency will be a member of that board. So part of the purpose of setting up that body was to achieve exactly what this, this, uh, this uh, amendment seeks to achieve. And thirdly, our commitment to establishing regional economic partnerships across Scotland. And I believe Mr Smith was a former chair of the House of Scotland Alliance, and I hope that he would see the value in an increased role for the Alliance, building on the successes and bringing together a wider group of agencies. Um, so um, I have listened with care. I'm sympathetic to the aims, but I think that there are better ways to achieve it. I hope that members uh, will believe that what I've expressed today is a, is a clear proof that the overall objective will be achieved in, with letters of guidance. Um, but, uh, and I don't think legislation is the best way forward here. Um, I am happy to explore that further before stage three though, uh, as we've done before stage two, and I'm happy to give that additional assurance to members today. And in conclusion, convener, I hope that in the light of these assurances and guarantees, and indeed they're very interesting and uh, every one relevant and germane point that's been made in the debate, I hope Mr. Smith will not press his amendment today. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Colin Smith, uh, can I ask you to wind up, please? Thank you. The, the standing point I would say is I do believe there does require to be something within the legislation um, to, to achieve this. The, the Cabinet Secretary used the, the interesting phrase that he hopes that the current coordination taking place with SOSET will continue. Well, hope is, is something we've all got, um, but there's no guarantees when it comes to hope, but there is a guarantee that if it's a legal requirement, then it has to continue. The Minister mentioned, for example, or the Cabinet Secretary sorry, mentioned that in the initial letter of guidance, um, coordination will be a key part of that. Well, letters of guidance change, uh, they, they, they change on a regular basis, Cabinet Secretaries change, governments change, um, a, 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 and a letter of guidance, in my view, isn't enough, because prior to SOSEP, we did have a lack of coordination, we did have a lack of working together, and we did have a lack of delivery amongst a lot of public bodies in Scotland. And uh, had we not had that lack of delivery, then there would be no requirement for this bill in the first place. So I do believe there's a need for a legal underpinning. Uh, I don't think there's anything in the wording, the use of the phrase operates in the south of Scotland, that would in any way restrict any organisation that, 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 that has any work taking place in, in the south of Scotland um, within the aims of the agency, it's important to stress, um, actually not not been involved in those discussions, and I, and I can't think of a, a single um, example uh, in, in, in which that's the, uh, the case. Um, Mike Rumble's asked, are existing duties not enough? Well, the reality is we've seen from the evidence that stakeholders believe that what's worked in the past, um, what's happened in the past has not been enough. There hasn't been that sufficient coordination amongst organisations. There have been huge gaps in what's been delivered in the south of Scotland. I make the point again that had those gaps not existed, had there not been a lack of coordination, a lack of working together in the past, we wouldn't have needed the bill in the first place. And I think that, that, that this, this amendment will, will underpin that legally. The Cabinet Secretary made reference to discussions with local authorities. I think it's important to point out in the local authorities evidence they were the ones that called for that and in fact Elaine Murray very specifically gave an example about how that could work which is in the form of a memorandum of understanding to avoid first of all duplication but also to make sure there are no gaps so this is something that's very much come from the local authorities um, in the first place so I mean I hear however that members have got a concern about maybe specific wording on that my personal view is that the best way to, to deal with that is to place this 
at stage two onto the onto the bill, and, and I'm more than happy to work with other members if we require to tweak the language. I, I, and the cabinet secretary will tweak the language in that amendment um, as we go towards stage three. And I'm certainly open to changes to the, the exact word as we go towards stage three. But I think the best way to achieve that is to place this in the bill, and then if it requires tweaks as we go forward, then to, to look at how we can how we can achieve that. But it's very important to say this was not only bringing forward an amendment to the bill was a recommendation of this committee in our stage one report, which is an important point to make, and crucially, it is something that stakeholders have called for. Yeah, I've kind of finished up there, but I can take a point, yeah. Very briefly. Yeah, I appreciate we're at the end of the debate, but I, I do have a concern that if, uh, uh, you know, in light of the, uh, the, the the balance of opinion in the committee, that if, if, if we pursue the amendment and it were not to pass, would it be quite difficult to bring the concept back at stage three, given precedent and the nature of things? I think there's an important point to be made in the bill in some form or shape, and my worry is that if, if the wording as it's currently drafted doesn't, doesn't pass in, a, in a, a minute or two, uh, that would actually make it more difficult to, to, to beef up the, the premise of what you're trying to achieve, which is, you know, uh, one of my concerns. The concern is that if it doesn't pass, um, it would be very difficult to put this amendment in at third stage, given the fact that, that some members seem to be implying that there's no requirement for anything at all within the legislation. And I have to say that's a, that, that's a real concern because, um, as I've said earlier, um, simply uh, ministerial direction letters, hoping things will, 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 will continue the way SOSEP's currently continue, and in my view, is not enough. We need to see something within the legislation to achieve that. So I'm going to ask you uh, to either press or withdraw your amendment, please. I, I think I'll, I'll press the amendment. Can be now. Okay, so <coughs> the question, therefore, we're raised at this stage is, is Amendment 43 agreed? Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed, therefore we'll move to a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. And as this is the first, sorry, as this is the first fact, could I just remind members, keep your hands up um, until the clerks have managed to, to record and, and keep them up as high as possible. So those in favour, sorry, please raise their hands. Okay. Those against? Okay, the result of that vote, there are four votes for the amendment. I'll get that out in a minute. There are four votes for the amendment, seven votes against. Therefore, the amendment is not agreed. I now call amendment 12 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with amendment 13. Cabinet Secretary, please, can you move amendment 12 and speak to both amendments in the group? Sorry, I'm having trouble with amendments this morning. Cabinet Secretary. Um, uh, thank you, Vina. The amendments in this group would require the Scottish Ministers to consult South of Scotland Enterprise before issuing any directions to it, and would also require them to publish the reasons behind any directions they issue. Um, I should say that both the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee and this committee called for these requirements to be put on the face of the bill in its Stage 1 report. I'm happy to accept those recommendations and to give effect to them uh, by these amendments, which I hope do just that. So, uh, uh, a well, they do do just that. It's not just a hope. <laughs> um, so, I move Amendment 12. Thank you. Uh, there are no members who wish to speak. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to wind up if you want to? Uh, it's okay. So, as you move the amendment, uh, the question, therefore, is Amendment 12 be agreed? Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Therefore, I call Amendment 13 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already a debated with Amendment 12. Cabinet Secretary, can you formally move it, please? Formally moved. The question, therefore, is Amendment 13 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Therefore, the question is Section 15 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. The, questions that, the question is that sections 16 to 19 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 44 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 43. Colin Smith, to move or not move? Um, not move, convener. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, therefore, I'll call Amendment 45 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 29. Um, Colin Smith, to move or not move? Uh, not move, convener. Thank you. I therefore call Amendment 46 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 29. Colin Smith to move or not uh, move? Not move, convener. 
Thank you. The question is that section 20 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that sections 21 and 22 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that the long title be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay, that ends stage two consideration of the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill. The bill will now be reprinted as amended at stage two. The Parliament has not yet decided when stage three will be held. Members will be informed of that in due course, along with the deadline for lodging stage three amendments. In the meantime, stage three amendments can be lodged with the clerks in the legislative team. And I think uh, I just really falls to me to thank the, the Cabinet Secretary and his officials for coming back to uh, the meeting today and also uh, to thank the members of this committee for what has turned out to be a marathon four and a quarter hour session to get through uh, the work that we had to do this morning. So thank you, Cabinet Secretary, and thank you, Committee. And I look forward to hopefully a shorter meeting next week. And therefore, I close the meeting.